Welcome to this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. I'm T.K. Kerstetter, and I'll be your host for today's show. Uh, Once again, we are operating remotely like most of the world, and we do miss our opportunity to be at the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. But again, we are adapting, and we will continue to try and address the issues that affect a board and company with the COVID-19 environment. So today we have an interesting meeting. We're gonna be talking about virtual annual shareholder meetings, key considerations and challenges. And joining me on the show today is Sherry Moreland, who's the president and chief operating officer of Median. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you, good morning, TK. So um, first of all, could you share with the audience exactly what Median does? I do know that you have a joint collaboration with um, the proxy specialist, Donnelly Financial Solutions, or as we call them, DFIN. Uh, could you just lightly touch on that uh, before we get started? Sure, we've had a long-term strategic partnership with uh, DFIN. It goes back more than 10 years. Uh, Median is a tech-enabled investor communications company. We provide solutions to brokers, corporate issuers, and fund issuers uh, for all aspects of investor communications. Specifically, where we work with DFIN is we have two products for uh, proxy, both directed at corporate issuers and fund issuers, and we handle sort of the proxy event, the mechanics of the meeting, distribution, tabulation, digital shareholder meetings from A to Z with both corporate issuers and fund issuers. We also work very closely with brokers for delivering Uh, their investor communications. But uh, we do this with our platform, connecting all of this ecosystem together with tools that help drive shareholder engagement. Well, you sound like the perfect person for us to dig a little deeper into this virtual shareholder uh, meeting. So let me offer just a little bit of history that I'm aware of. And first of all, I suspect that this virtual meeting was born out of several reasons. Um, Cost considerations, obviously it's easier to do, particularly those companies that might be remotely located. Um, Second of all, there um, a lot of the um, companies, particularly the smaller ones, uh, the annual shareholder meeting was a non-event. There was not many people that attended. Um, There wasn't big issues to discuss. So it seemed like a reasonable shortcut And to provide some context to that, in 2011, under 25 U.S. public companies conducted virtual shareholder meetings. So at that time, though, institutional investors and proxy advisors like ISS and Glass-Lewis weren't so excited about the concept of uh, virtual um, shareholder meetings, uh, partly because they were worried that the disclosure and the way to get in for a lot of investors wasn't, wasn't easy. Um, there wasn't the opportunity to go face-to-face with management and the board of directors in a meeting, which has some good emotion to it. And equally, they were concerned that uh, companies might cherry pick the questions that come in and not deal with the uh, ones that were um, harder. So. Uh, That seemed to morph. We saw some growth. And if we skip to 2019, last year, some 248 companies conducted virtual annual meetings. Um, And the institutional investors sort of took the position that said, as long as you're good in the disclosure and meeting general guidelines that had been developed over those years, um, we won't vote against your um, NOMGov committee or whatever it is. So we certainly saw growth, not tremendous growth, but we saw growth over that time. Now we jump ahead to today. We're in the coronavirus environment. 
the CDC health recommendation said don't gather large groups of people together, um, which isn't good for uh, annual meetings, obviously, on bringing shareholders together. So um, it's easy to project, I think, Sherry, that this year um, there are uh, a great number of public companies that are looking into the virtual um, annual shareholder meeting option, uh, whether that's virtual only or in some cases, I guess you could do a hybrid where you, you, you permit attendance and have people with social distancing, but I think that's going to be very difficult to pull off. So virtual seems like a great option, particularly if they don't choose to postpone. So knowing that, let's talk a little bit about some of the considerations and challenges that companies and boards have when they want to go virtual annual meetings. Uh, you're absolutely right. This is bringing about the coronavirus is bringing about a huge change uh, in our industry this year. Um, I think as of March 1st of this year, we were probably on the same track as last year. We were going to see some growth in virtual annual meetings. And of course, the coronavirus has changed every bit of that. Uh, we now know or see issuers flocking to a virtual annual meeting, and that's because they want to keep their calendars on track. They want to have their annual meeting uh, taken care of, and virtual annual meetings offer a fantastic way for them to do that. But there are some considerations. Uh, fortunately, the technology piece or how you conduct a virtual annual meeting is very easy to take care of. There are several providers out there, and it's quite simple. It's a a video conference, it's an audio conference, it's something like a WebEx platform, and people are very familiar with that technology today. But some of the challenges that issuers have to look at, and they have to do it on a very quick basis, their meetings are starting uh, right now, is pick a provider, understand your bylaws, your bylaws may need to have some type of amendment, and most importantly, work with your council to understand what the state laws are. The SEC has always been very clear that virtual annual meetings uh, were uh, under the state's purview. Uh, heading into this season, uh, 40 something states allowed some form of a virtual annual meeting. Uh, sometimes they allowed virtual with a hybrid where you still had the in-person uh, meeting. But some states did not allow it. So very quickly, most states have now passed some type of resolution that allow the virtual annual meeting. However, they did this early in March, and they often tacked deadlines onto it. So we believe that all of these states are going to make modifications. It's very, very important to work uh, with your council to understand how your state uh, overviews or looks at virtual annual meetings. So picking a vendor, understanding your bylaws, and uh, understanding what you can do with your state of incorporation are very important considerations. Well, we would hope that everybody would be sensitive to the environment, you know, proxy advisors. You know, we've heard, we've heard that most um, groups are very understanding of what's going to happen. That doesn't mean that they are giving carte blanche carte blanche to going forward, okay, in the sense of future years. But I think everybody is doing their best to work together to make sure that they can pull off these meetings, you know, effectively giving investors what they need and getting whatever votes or compliance issues taken care of at the meeting. And those are all, that's all true. I mean, I think the entire industry has pulled together and worked hard at helping issuers uh, come up with Plan B. The SEC guidance was very strong. It allows them numerous options. They can try to have their in-person meeting. They can adopt a hybrid meeting. They can even decide to go with a virtual annual meeting as a contingency. And even if their proxy material is already mailed, they have options for deciding to go to virtual only by sending out a press release, updating their IR sites with the details. What you have to be careful about in this situation is that you're communicating effectively with your shareholders, uh, particularly if your proxy is already uh, mailed. Uh, so shareholders need to understand that you are going to adopt a virtual meeting. Um, they need to get instructions about how to access uh, the virtual annual meeting, and you can do this by uh, posting it 
on your IR side, if you have not mailed your proxy statement, make sure you provide very robust disclosure in the proxy statement about why you're doing this and how to do it. Well, uh, like we said in our first remote show, communicate, communicate, communicate. You just almost can't communicate enough. And um, uh, sure, we got about one minute left, but I would assume that that a lot of this falls on the corporate secretary um, to you know work with the board and work with management to make sure that all this is in place and viable for the meeting. But I guess from a from a board member's perspective, I guess the main thing here is making sure that again uh, that uh, everything is clear. You know, you've got this is a potential for great confusion out there to investors. So um, they just need to make sure that um, the company is communicating, following all the compliant rules and making it as easy as possible for the investor to participate. That's absolutely true. And your, your opening remarks about communication could not be more applicable here. Because what you want to make sure is that the investor understands what's happening and their rights as an investor are being protected. So the virtual annual meeting will allow you to ask questions, uh, vote your proxy. The board can help, first of all, by working with the corporate secretary to amend bylaws if necessary. Also, to understand how the uh, meeting is going to progress. What is their role in the meeting? How do they use uh, the technology? We recommend for our clients that they do a dry run of the meeting. So, communicating with your board and with your investors is very uh, critical right now, and then making sure the mechanics of your meeting uh, run well. But as I said, the technology piece of that is honestly the easiest piece. It's uh, trying to do something new in an environment where you hadn't considered it when resources are already constrained because of remote working and other, other issues that the virus has brought about. But I think it's a great opportunity, yes, of course, to get your meeting done, but if handled correctly, uh, this gives uh, issuers a fantastic opportunity to engage their shareholders. Well, Sherry, I, wa I want to thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, your uh, insight has been valuable. Um, and um, uh, hopefully uh, we will see um, everybody cooperating and getting through this proxy season um, the best way we can. And again, I want to thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Take care. And that will conclude this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week when we take another look at, the, at a topic in this coronavirus environment that will help you be a better board member or a better effective committee. So we'll see you then. We are, I want to stress to everybody to be safe and work together to get through this, and we will. And we'll see you next week. <music>